This is a society where a woman's power is to be beautiful. And to be beautiful, you have to be fat. Are you hoping they will let you through? Lives are changed here. A new series of the award-winning Unreported World, Friday at 7.30 on Channel 4. <laughs> Welcome back to the programme where Channel 4 is bringing the voters back into the heart of the Brexit debate by surveying 20,000 people on their hopes and fears. In a moment, we'll find out how the nation would vote in an in-out referendum today. But first, we wanted to find out how people think Brexit will impact on their lives. Now, on the economy overall, only 35% of people think it will have a good impact. More, 49% think the impact on the economy overall in Britain will be bad. But what about ourselves, our own households? When it comes to household finances, what do we think about that? Well, only 18% of people think Brexit will be good for their household finances, and 44% think it will be bad for them, with 38% saying it will make no difference. Let's see what some of our guests today here uh, feel. Um, Sharon, what, what, what do you think um, Brexit's think going to mean for your household? Uh, well, it isn't just my household, it's uh, the city as a whole. I come from Stoke-on-Trent and the majority were uh, to leave, uh, but they voted to leave because uh, they were railroaded into a, a, the, wrong you know, the wrong decision. They were, they were misled um, and the people of Stoke-on-Trent obviously didn't realise that voting to leave it could have a big impact you know? on their industry. Did you think that? Yeah, I'd, yeah because the, the, the industry, um, it'll take a big hit because most of the, uh, in, the production of the pot trees is export, a, a large percentage. So when the Brexit does go through, we need free trade because what will happen is if we don't, um, it can kill a city. How about you? What, what do you think Brexit's going to do? Um, if I'm going to be truly honest, I kind of don't believe it will make a difference, if I'm, if I'm going to be honest. I, c I compare it to, like, um, the recession, and when everyone was saying we're, the, the country's in a recession, when we come out of a recession, things are going to get better. We're supposed to be out of recession, and for me, I haven't really seen the difference. Well, I don't... you're saying that because you feel you've got nothing to lose. No, no I've definitely got a lot to lose, if I'm going to be honest, but I'm saying the difference between the recession, for me, then, personally, the difference between when there was a recession and when, and, uh, when we suddenly came out of the recession, I didn't see it. So I kind of look at this as being the same thing. I think it's going to make more of an impact on politicians, bankers and big businesses than the little people in the communities. How about you? I mean, there is not a lot of confidence that Brexit is going to be good for the economy. I can't see how it will be. Well, I work for an organisation called Beat Freaks, which provides platforms for young people in the city. Um, and I don't think that they've been taken into account at all. People like Nigel, I don't think that you've ever moved out of your own experience to have a conversation with anybody else to see how it might impact you and how uh, yeah. the things that you're saying are going to impact people in the city. Birmingham is going to more say, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises than any other city outside of London. We've got the highest youth population outside. Um, we've got the highest youth population in Europe as well. I feel like it's going to be a problem for jobs, it's going to be a problem for supply lines, and ultimately it's going to be bad for future generations in this city. OK, thank you. Um... John Curses, um, do these views on the economy matter? Do they change people's views? Uh, these views undoubtedly matter. There's nothing more clearly a subject on which Remain and Leave of voters disagree than on the economic consequence of Brexit. Around four in five Remain voters think it's going to be bad for the economy, but around two-thirds of Leave voters think it's going to be good. And many of the remainders simply say it won't make much difference. And there's no other subject on which they disagree more. And there is, by the way, no other subject that, insofar as people have changed their minds since two years ago, there's no other subject that seems to encourage people to change their minds than if they change their views about the economic consequences of Brexit. So the economic debate is absolutely crucial, but notice that even now, apparently only around a half of the country actually think it's going to be bad. This is still the subject 
on which we are very seriously divided, much as we were two years ago. But are, are people prepared to say, I think it's going to be bad for the economy, but I still want it? There are very reasons. many. As I already said to you, around two-thirds of Leave voters think it's going to be good for the economy, and most of the remaining one-third say it just won't make any difference. The crucial thing you need to understand there, no difference is code for it will be all right on the night. Um, David Gordon, mm. people are right to be worried about the economy, aren't they? It depends on the nature of our departure. If we leave mm. on no deal terms, there's mm. no good shying away. It will be very bad for us economically. But even with a deal, will we be better off with a deal than we are now economically inside the European Union? Well, if, if, if we can get a good deal, and that means well, removing let's say you all get the friction. May's deal. The Chequers type deal, um, so we don't have friction with trade, then economically, I don't think it's going to make a particular big difference. So one we way won't or the be other. better off. I'm, I'm not arguing that we, we will, I just don't think it will be but, that big an impact. So one we way will or be the worse other. off, but just a bit worse off. <laughs> I think. His own government well, I think there's, statistics show that we're look, going to be worse I, I, off. Every single scenario that, that you well, tried to hide with make, your impact assessments, count, every single one of them show the country count, worse count, off. Count, Let him finish. The British people made a decision to leave the European Union. You can make a simple case where well, they got it wrong and so on, but I think that would, that would be very dangerous, very damaging to our political stability. You can also make an argument, well, British people have voted to leave and we'll just get on with it and it doesn't matter what we do, we just get on and leave. And, you know, Nigel can make that case and there's a lot of clarity, but there are economic risks in doing that, which is why the government has to try to square this circle of trying to get the best deal economically for us, protect jobs and livelihoods, whilst also clearly Barry, leaving the European Barry Union. Gardner, will you say the British people will be worse off after Brexit than they are now. Let me be clear, both David and I um, said before the referendum that we would be worse off. So there's no point in pulling so out you of still that, think that. Um, We said that. I still believe that economically we are likely to be worse off. That is, but of course economics is not the only thing that matters. People were also voting in the referendum about whether they wanted ever closer union in the EU and other political matters. But that's why what we've done in saying that we will respect the result of the referendum, even though I still believe that we will be worse off economically, we've said we have to mitigate that damage and that is why a new customs union that solves the just-in-time supply chain that actually meets the, the issue of that 44% of exports that Caroline was talking about, that's why making sure that those jobs are protected, the economy is protected as much as possible is the important way of doing this that can begin to try and reunite the 52 and the 48 But you are both united in saying tonight this is an act of economic self-harm. Well, I've said that for a long time. I said it before. Uh, I say it since. Uh, but I do say that the British people gave us a mandate to do otherwise, but, and that's why we respect but it. But Barry, the biggest single economic risk is if we don't get a deal. Now, if the Prime Minister comes back with a deal, and we haven't got a deal yet, but if she comes back with a deal, a deal that is actually on the table, not a fantasy deal, a deal that is on the table, will the Labour Party vote it down and risk a no deal? Because that would be an act of economic self harm David, the, I the, much, much the, 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 the idea that um, after the incompetence that your government has shown over the past two years in these negotiations, that you come back and say, well, I know we've sorry, messed it up. Um, <laughs> I know we've messed it up, but this is all we could do so uh, and get it through the cabinet. So Therefore, you've we, got, got to, to move on for that or no deal. I, I want to get that some more results. That is a ludicrous suggestion. Because we also You're... asked if people thought Brexit would be good for levels of immigration. Now, good is in the eye of the beholder, of course. But 45% of people think Brexit will be good for immigration, 24% of people think it will be bad, and 31%, nearly one in three, think it will make no difference at all. Now, 42% of people also think immigration more generally has had a positive impact on Britain, and that's a very significant result because it's changed a lot over the years. 42% think immigration is positive. Let's go back five years to 2013. Only 26% of people used to say that immigration was positive, and 56% said it was negative. John Curtis, what does it mean? Well, there are two things to take together there. The first, indeed, this is not the first survey to show that in the last couple of years or so, 
attitudes towards immigration have become more favourable. That said, notice how sceptical the public were about immigration five years ago. We simply got back on the evidence of this poll to a situation where we're pretty evenly divided as to whether we think immigration is a good thing or a bad thing or not. But to go back to your first result, this is the one subject on which we leave voters are most convinced. Over 70% of them think that Brexit will be good for immigration and meanwhile Remain voters frankly aren't terribly sure. So that's why you end up with this very clear majority of saying it's going to be good, uh, Brexit's going to be good for immigration. It's again a subject which clearly sings above all to the hearts of Leave voters. Uh, Nina Schick, I mean things are going the other way in Europe though aren't they? Make no mistake about it, immigration is one of the most important issues across the European continent. However, there's an important caveat and distinction to make about the debate in European countries and the debate that was had here. The kind of sentiment that you see towards immigration in the European countries has to do with non-EU immigration. It has a lot to do with the migration crisis, the asylum crisis, of which in 2015, the UK did not have to accept EU asylum seekers and migrants. It is not about free movement of people. It is not about the right of other EU citizens to live, travel and work freely in other EU countries. But immigration, per se, is going to be one of the most defining issues in European politics in the years to come. Right, well, um, Birmingham is one of the most diverse cities in the UK. Let's talk to some of you from here. Um, Elena, where are you? Elena, I mean, how has the post-Brexit debate affected the way you feel in this country? I'm welcome, quite simply. I'm an European citizen. I've been here for 10 years out of 36 of my life. Have you noticed that change? Yes. When I came here for the first time when I was 16, I felt very welcome. And as a consequence, I chose to move back when I was 30. Um, I quit my job in Germany and moved over here. And I was happy until the referendum. And since then, fundamentally, people have been very negative about migration. They don't distinguish, as the lady just said, between EU and non-EU migration. The government has been rather unforthcoming in securing our rights. Um, Theresa May has said, and the devil is in the detail, we will broadly and purely broadly secure EU citizens' rights, and we still have no system to register or any actual documentation with which our rights will be secured in writing. What do you make of those, those figures that show people are much more positive about immigration? Well, we are from the restaurant sector, voted to leave with the hope that we'll get a fair immigration and recruitment system for the survival of our businesses. When we come to recruitment, there's a law for minimum wage if you are recruiting from Europe. There is another law and policies if you are recruiting outside Europe. Well, do you think you did the right thing? We have done the right thing as long as the government's attitudes will change. It is the government, it belongs up to the government to make sure that we have the right uh, Brexit policies and we have a fair Brexit policies that will help our restaurant industries. Stuart, you're a farmer, aren't you? I am indeed, yeah. Um, so, I mean, what do you make of how Britain feels about immigration and immigrants? Well, I think one of the things that, that some of the language that's been used historically has been very hostile. And I think one of the things we see in our sector is actually migrant labour, whether that be seasonal or permanent labour, is absolutely critical to our sector, but it hasn't been valued because of some of the hostile language used by a minority of people. And we have got to have a plan. We are sat here at the moment where there is fruit and veg being left unpicked Fresh fruit and veg exactly. being left unpicked. Mm. Factories in the food industry working short weeks because we are already seeing the effects of this because of that hostile environment. And we have got to get to a point where we value the migrant labour and we value everyone in society. Yeah. 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 I think that the EU promotes freedom of movement of white Westerners and I think if we, when we leave the EU we can open up our borders to people from all over the world. You know, there's places where there's surplus of nurses, we need more nurses, why are we prioritising people from Europe? I think we leave the EU, we open up the borders, we can let in more refugees, more asylum seekers. I don't see the problem with immigration at all. But I think the real problem is not politics, it's the hostile environment they face. Okay. Um, Nigel Farage, are you feeling a little out of touch with this? 
Funny, isn't it? On the one hand, we're being told Brexit has made people hostile towards migrants. On the other, we're told we're more relaxed about it. You can't have it both ways. The truth of it is... It, 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 ridiculous. The truth of it is, the reason those figures have changed is a big chunk of the electorate think the immigration issue has been dealt with because we voted Brexit and they think our major political parties will carry out their wishes. Actually, the penny's not yet dropped, that there is no intention from this government or this opposition to deal with open-door immigration. So we, at the moment, are in a holding zone. If you look across the rest of Europe, it is the issue that is completely redefining European politics. Or, or maybe when you said it was breaking point with those posters, it wasn't. Well, it's broken uh, virtually everything, hasn't it? Look at Italy. It's broken Italian politics so completely you can't believe it. It's led to Viktor Orban now having two-thirds of seats in the Hungarian parliament. And right across Europe, there is a radical change that is taking place. Uh, and I think, you know, it's funny, we also talk about economics. Let's just remember, folks, it's the European Union that has destroyed the prospects economically of tens of millions of young people living in the Mediterranean. And, and you know, there is one big point here. We can ask, and we can talk economics, we can talk immigration. We're missing the most important point tonight. We voted to leave. We were asked in a general election to back two parties who said they'd honour it. We voted for it again, and now they're betraying all of us. That's the real point about this debate well, tonight. Let's see what people think. Caroline Lucas. To suggest that it's the fault of the EU as an institution that we saw those horrendous pictures of migrants being turned away is absolutely wrong. It was the fault of individual EU governments. That is not the same as the EU institutions. The Commission, the European Parliament, were doing their best to actually be far but more are compassionate. are you sure if, if... I mean, look, Nigel Farage said at the, at the beginning, we haven't had them campaigning and making these arguments that he's making tonight. If we have all of this again, if we unleash this again, are you sure this is still where public opinion is going to be? I think, even if I wasn't sure, I think it is the democratic thing to do. So I think it's the right thing to do, irrespective of the fact that if it happens, I will be fighting very hard for us to remain. Because you've just heard the most extraordinary thing from Barry. I love Barry. But the idea that we have to commit what he says is an act of economic harm, because it's the will of the people. And the Labour Party won't go back and just check with the will of the people before you actually do something oh, that's going to massively hurt. No, no, no. That's no, no. no, no. Right. Well, Carol, let's, let's sorry. get on. Christian, no, Let, no. Caroline knows very well, and, and this was concluded at our party conference recently, so it's not old news, right? N knows very well that we've said that if Theresa May cannot secure a majority in Parliament, we would call for a general election, but if we don't get a general election, we would then say that it then has to we will go come back, back to, to the people. We will come so back to this. You can't say that we've ruled that out. We let's, have not. We've not let's get to the big number. Let's, let's get to forward. the big result. Uh, we have heard the public red lines for the Brexit negotiations and how they feel about leaving the EU and how it's likely to impact on their lives. Let's get to our big question. Servation analysed the responses of 20,000 voters from every constituency across the UK. The largest independent survey conducted on Brexit since the referendum. Now, we asked the same question as was asked back in 2016. Should the UK remain in the European Union or leave the European Union? And the result is... We're in. There you are, 54% would vote to remain today, 46% would vote to leave. It would appear a clear majority now in favour of staying in the EU. And let's have a look at how the country has changed geographically. Now, that's how things looked back in 2016. You'll see the, the blue areas are leave, the yellow are remain. You see Scotland, Northern Ireland, some of the metropolitan cities uh, are remain. The rest is blue. Let's have a look at it today. It is transformed. Look at that. Wales has gone, remain. The South West has gone, remain. Whole swathes of the North East. <laughs> Let's just go back. Let's have a look at that change again. Let's go. That's, that's what it was in 2016. And today, that is quite a dramatic change. Barry Gardner, are you on the right side? <laughs> um, 
Yes, because um, I think what you've shown is our nation continues to be incredibly divided. You, you've now said 56, 40, 44. Um, we remain an incredibly divided nation. Uh, and actually, um, going back and, and doing another referendum, you may get that result. What you would have is you would have increased those divides enormously. And that's what I, I find deeply troubling about this. David Gork, a quick uh, reaction to this. But that's why there is a way of respecting the referendum, and that is what we put forward in terms of a new customs union. That's what we put forward. Jeremy actually made right. the offer heard, to Theresa May. Let's just get to a reaction get to these numbers. Through. David Gork. Look, I, I, I have to say, until we got to the last bit, I agree with Barry on this, I'm afraid, that a decision was made. Um, we are, of course, in, at the sort of end of a negotiation, at a period where there is, we all have to accept a lot of uncertainty. And at this point, I am, I have to say, not at all surprised that there has been a swing back to remain. I think if we get a deal, then there could well be a swing back to leave. If we don't get a deal, then I suspect there'll be a further swing to remain. But just at this point, you know. Public opinion will move around, but we had a referendum. Well, it's, well, it's gone we the other way. Said, we all John said Curtis, we respect that result. John Curtis, unpick this for us. Well, I think it's important to understand what lies underlying this movement. What does not underlie this movement is many voters changing their minds. Of the 6% swing or so that we see to remain as compared with 2016, only about 1% is the result of the fact that Leave voters are slightly more likely to say they'd vote Remain than Remain voters are likely to vote to Leave. What lies behind this actually is, is an awful lot to do with Turner. Uh, the biggest element are those people who did not vote in 2016, who in this survey, like many other surveys, are around 2 to 1 in favour of Remain. Now, of course, many of these people are young people. Around 57% of the people who did not vote in 2016 are under 35. So therefore, it won't also surprise you to hear that one of the other things this poll shows underneath the, the, the names of this is that the swing towards Remain has been strongest amongst younger voters. It's virtually absent amongst older voters. So to that extent, at least, that age divide does indeed now look to be wider. But there's one other thing, however, to understand, which is also, well, to, which is interesting, which is that the swing towards leaves, away from leave, seems to have been greatest in those places that were most heavily in favour of leave in 2016. So there, some, so there is you know, it, it's the local, local authority areas that, like Sunderland that we saw earlier that were most pro-leave okay. that seem to have swing back most. Uh, Caroline Lucas, this isn't big enough for you, is it? It's just not decisive well, enough. It's not the end of the story, but what I want to say is that um, what we need to be doing is recognising as well that Many of the people who voted leave had legitimate grievances, very legitimate grievances that need to be tackled. So the People's Vote campaign isn't just saying, let's just swap and see if we can get you know, a vote like this and just change the, the, the balance. What we're saying is we need to look at those underlying reasons that drove people to feel so, so fed up and so angry with the establishment. The fact that they haven't been able to get their kids into local schools. The fact that uh, the NHS has been crumbling because successive governments have failed to invest in it. So I simply want to say that I think it's massively important important that the People's Vote campaign and all of us who want to see the opportunity for the people to have a say recognise that it's not about but turning can I the tell clock you something back for two years. Just, just one point, point but do, do, it's not about turning the clock back two years. It's about saying, let us make sure that we address those underlying reasons that drove so many people to feel that the only solution was to leave the EU, when in fact leaving the EU will make things worse. When for we them. looked at voter turnout, only 48% of 18 to 24-year-olds say they will definitely vote in another referendum. That is the same percentage who voted in 2016. There isn't a great activation of young people who when want I to overturn find that Brexit. Figure, I do find that figure really surprising because we've seen the wonderful campaigns by our future, our choice. We've seen the fact that the 700,000 people marching through London a couple of weeks ago were led by young people. But Brexit is the biggest act of intergenerational betrayal that you could come across. And young people are rightly hugely angry that their futures are the ones that are being put at stake on this. Do you, do you respect public opinion? Given we have a government that doesn't believe in Brexit and we make the arguments for it, 
given that you've got just the Remain argument... I mean, look at this room. There's a room full of Remainers. No, just me. it's not. It's absolutely not. On the, on the panel... Remain, 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 remain. Brexit, right. Brexit. So, four Remainers. Remain, Brexit. Four, they voted Remain. Yes, they but they are both in favour of Brexit. No, 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 <laughs> they're, no. But they're not making the Brexit arguments. You have not heard the Brexit argument made for the last 18 months, and we're still on 46%. If, if the democratic will of the people is overturned and betrayed, and they force us to vote again, I'm convinced from those figures... Leave would win by a much bigger margin <laughs> next time. We're going to give the, the last words again to, to the people. Uh, Mathamwi Carvel, what do you make of that? Oh, he's just talking rubbish again, aren't you, Nigel? Um, I live uh, 20 minutes away from the Northern Irish border. I understand exactly what's going to happen if your unfortunate project goes ahead and it's not going to be pretty. Let's, yeah. let's look at this survey, let's go for the people's vote and let's focus on the real things that are at hand uh, happening in this country right now, which is the underfunding of the NHS, yes. the underfunding of the police service, yep. the fact that Northern Ireland don't have a government. <laughs> I think, these, I think these results are really a barometer of um, the, the difficulty surrounding the negotiations at the moment. I, I think people feel a bit of a lack of confidence, a bit of confusion about where we are, and I think that these statistics represent that. But I think that, look, the, the public made their call on this some time ago, and they did so for some really valid reasons, and I think those reasons remain. Um, so. Okay. I'm still positive that... Thank you. Um, look, one of the astonishing things, in, as that map went, was Wales went Remain. So Scotland is Remain, Northern Ireland is Remain, Wales is Remain. You know what, from our results tonight, England has gone Remain as well. How do you bring the country together now? This is a mess. It's, it's the right question, because we do have to bring the country together. And two years ago, we had a narrow victory for Leave. On, on this survey... A narrow, you know, remain our head uh, relatively narrowly. We have got to find a way of coming together as a country, which means rejecting the sort of simple answers that there's an easy way that you can just do this, um, that you can just walk through it and it'll all be fine, because that isn't the real world. It is a complicated negotiation. It will require compromises from us and from the European Union. And if we can deliver a deal that respects the referendum result, but protects jobs and livelihoods and keeps the United Kingdom a United Eggs Kingdom, will then, then we, th then, in then, then we, we are doing what the public needs us to do. Does this make any difference to a second Scotland independence referendum? It doesn't. We're in the survey, we find almost as many yes voters who say they would now be less likely to vote yes as a result of Brexit as we find no voters move in the opposite direction. So there's no obvious evidence that Scotland would vote differently in an independence referendum than the way it did back in 2014. Uh, Barry Gardner, are you definitely not going to change your mind? You know, your party now <laughs> is overwhelmingly Remain. 70% of Labour voters, according to this survey, that Remain. Christian, we are a democratic party, right? And that means we must respect democracy. We, we gave the people the opportunity in that referendum to reach a conclusion. We campaigned against it. We, we said that we didn't think it was the right course economically for our country to, to go down. We've tried to respect that, but what we've done at every stage, at every stage, is we've tried to bring the 52 and the 48 back closer together. We continue to do that in the proposals that we have put forward to Theresa May about how she could Got get leave it there, a afraid. deal you through don't. Parliament. I'm so sorry we're out of time, but we, we could have gone on all night. We've got to leave it there. Thank you. All of the results are online tonight. You can go to the Channel 4 News website to see them. Thank you to everyone here and to all of you for watching. For now, good night. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. They were counting me off.